Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Professors of Profits podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Feel, and I have a very special guest with us today, Tony Maritato. I like to uh, liken him to that of almost a mad scientist uh, in the very best of ways. He practices a bunch of different things online, uh, a lot of different streams of revenue, much like myself. But uh, today we're here to talk specifically about YouTube and the YouTube monetization process and how that can be looked at as a separate stream of revenue. Um, so, Tony, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on today to talk to us a little bit about this. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit, Tony, about uh, your background and kind of where it led you to today, because I know you've done, like I said, just a ton of things, um, but uh, overall, practice owner is kind of one of the primary ones. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just kind of give them the cliff notes. Basically, um, I started a private practice before I was a physical therapist back in 2022, or it is 2000, back in 2002. And so what happened was I had graduated with a degree in kinesiology. I love sports. I love athletics. I had my, my CSCS certification and I opened a little personal training studio. It was on Siesta Key down in Sarasota, Florida. Um, it was all obviously cash-based. I was not a physical therapist, but I realized within the first year, most of the clientele really needed to work with a physical therapist. So I recruited an amazing physical therapist who is now my wife. We ended up going into partnership. The first year we were all personal training. The second year we were all physical therapy. And we learned through the school of hard knocks and we grew to five locations across two states. We had a team of clinicians, team of admin. We brought our billing in-house. We did our own marketing. We really learned how to run a business. But I have always been entrepreneurial at heart. Like I was that kid in the neighborhood who would, you know, do anything to earn a dollar. And I didn't care about the dollar. I just love the creative process of turning something into money, trading something that had value for money. And so, you know, since I was nine years old, I was doing things and washing cars and mowing grass and anything I could come across. Um, and I still just love the creative process. That's why everybody sees me I do this for a while and I do that for a while and I'm, I've got a hand in everything because that's what keeps it fresh. That's what keeps it fun. Like I'm certainly no expert in any of the topics, but I've got a general broad knowledge base and I dive as deep as I can when I get into a topic. So I consume all of the content I can find. I read all the books. I watch all the videos. I do everything um, almost to the point of burnout. But then what happens is, and, and you know, I'm 46 now. I've learned the lesson that these things kind of cycle. So where I've got videos on my YouTube channel going back 10, 15 years, um, I realized that I do a bunch, really intense, work really hard, never get that good, and then kind of burn out. And then I come back to it a couple of years later. And then I come back a third time and a fourth time until it eventually clicks. That's what happened with me for websites and SEO. That's what happened with YouTube. That's what's happened with so many things. My physical therapy clinics pay the bills. That's the business. That's the rock steady. Like I'll never do anything that compromises that, but that funds my passion. I treat patients because I enjoy treating patients. I create YouTube content because I enjoy that. And so I just think that, you know, I've learned a lot of hard lessons. I've wasted a lot of time and money. And hopefully I can share some of those lessons with your viewers so that they can learn from my mistakes. Yeah, Tony, you hit a lot of key points there. One, I, I think being some form of creative is important for entrepreneurs. You know, I, I'm the same way. I, I was an English major before I became a physical therapist. So, you know, writing was always a passion of mine. That's why I published my first book, just because I knew I had to. I, I just, I, I love creating. I love trying new things. Uh, and I think to some extent, you know, entrepreneurs have that in them because they have yeah. to, right? we have to create answers to problems a lot of the times sometimes it's you know answers for our clients or our public you know the people that are looking for answers sometimes it's for us right what's what's not working what's the log jam here how do i have to fix it right and so i think you know for me entrepreneurship gives me that creative outlet you know whereas i teach you know in physical therapy school nine to five uh like you said that provides you know a roof over my head and pays the bills but it also gives me the medical benefits that i need you know for my wife who's a type 1 diabetic so that's very important to me and it's a it's a, a passion of mine i love teaching 
But the entrepreneurial side of things is where I get to, you know, use my creative mind a little bit, really get out there and try things and experiment and see what works and what doesn't, and hopefully share that knowledge, you know, with other people looking to do these things. Um, so let's dive into the YouTube game a little bit here. I think, you know, some people know that you can monetize YouTube. Some people have no idea. Some people, uh, even though they know, think it's all impossible. That's way too much. But the, the gist of it is, you know, you need to have at least a thousand subscribers and 4,000 watched hours to start monetizing the commercials on YouTube, right? Whether it be a pre-roll or a mid-roll or a post-roll uh, during your video. Uh, that took me about three years to get to that point. Um, it wasn't overnight. You know, it was uh, lots and lots of videos on lots and lots of different content, all under the umbrella of, you know, multiple revenue streams type thing for healthcare providers. But, um, you know, uh, your your approach is, is a neat one. I actually like the uh, idea of how you kind of started a channel and how it's kind of become a group and how it's really blossomed. So tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel and, and how that's working out. Yeah, so I've I've been experimenting with different strategies, you know, and, and just for maybe some of the viewers who don't totally know, it is it's a thousand subscribers and 4000 hours of watch time within 365 days. So it is challenging when you don't get the view time because I have a channel, I have three, three main channels that I focus on my total knee replacement support or total knee replacement channel, which is associated with the support group. And we'll talk about that. Um, that was the first one to get monetized, but my billing channel, my learn Medicare billing, similar to you, it's in that kind of healthcare make money niche. It is just dog slow. And I had reached 4,000 hours, but it wasn't in 365 days. So it had taken even longer to get that channel monetized. And when we say monetization, this is one way to monetize a channel. It basically just means that YouTube and Google, the owner of YouTube, will show commercials on your, your channel and pay you a percentage of that revenue. And so when you guys see me share screenshots, like my knee replacement channel usually earns on average $1,000 a month. That is just from the ad revenue that YouTube is showing either, like you said, before, during, or after my videos. Um, so it really is a passive income stream, but you could monetize a channel with a, a paid course. You can monetize a channel with sponsorship. You can monetize a channel just by looking at, at it as lead generation for your physical therapy business. So there's lots of ways to earn money from YouTube. But basically what I did with my knee replacement channel was I had the channel forever. I mean, a decade of just sitting there doing nothing. Um, I put a handful of videos up. I didn't understand the YouTube algorithm at the time. This would have been 2000, probably 19. One of the videos just gained traction. It was how to sleep after a total knee replacement, physician specific. And all of a sudden, one day I go to the channel, it's got like 60,000 views. And that put fuel in my tank to say, wow, this is something that maybe I should put some more time into. Um, I had also created a closed Facebook group specific for knee replacement. It was called the Total Knee Replacement Support Group. Now I added for kind people after the title about a year ago. But that too, it just kind of, I made the group. I said, you know, there's so many groups out there not run by clinicians. We need to have some sort of kind of stake in this. So I want to help people. I want to answer questions. That group provides me with ideas for content. That group provides me with insight into what the consumer is thinking, because I'm a therapist. I'm going to do evaluations the rest of today. Patients are going to tell me in a new evaluation what they think I want to hear, right? They're not going to tell me the truth. And so I want to be behind the scenes so I can see patients talking to other patients and really what they're concerned about, really what their frustrations are. Because as I learn that language, not the clinician language, I can create better content that relates and addresses those fears. And I'll tell your audience, like, I went through all the same stuff. I would get so nervous when I'd turn on a camera. I'd try to look at that little black dot and my mind would go blank. I could feel the saliva in the corner of my mouth. Like I would just, it would be miserable. But I knew that this was something that we needed to do. And for those clinicians who want to help on a larger scale, like this is a platform that you can leverage 
internationally, globally to address an audience that would never in a million years have access to you. You know, so so many of us say we got into the profession because we love to help people. If we really want to help people, we would provide them access to the knowledge and the resources that are hidden in these four walls, you know, because you're providing content every single day. You're just not documenting it. And that's a, lo- a line from Gary V that don't think of creating content. Don't think of making videos and editing and music and all that stuff. Just document what you do. You know, and so I remember some of the first videos, I would literally set the camera up, point it at me. I would have a patient in my exam room sitting in a chair and I would record my side of the conversation. None of the patient stuff, but when they asked me, what's better, do I use heat or ice? I'd hit record, I'd record me telling that person what my response is. You know, they asked me what's better, machines or freeways? Those are the questions that real people are asking. And if, if we just started and documenting those answers, we would help a massive percentage of the population. Yeah, I think you, again, hit a lot of key points there and, and basically answered my next question. But, you know, why, why should professors or clinicians look into YouTube? And, I, you know, I think one of the big messages there, the take home is, a, it's a much broader audience, right? We're able to reach many, many more internationally, even if we want to. Uh, and that platform, as it grows, helps us establish ourselves as authorities on the on the topic or experts on the topic, you know? And I think, you know, growing that expertise and that authority starts having you, you know, get out there and have your face and name out there a little bit more. Um, You know, you've got the knowledge, you've got, you know, the expertise. So now you're just sharing it instead of the eight patients that you're going to see that day, you're now able to share it to, you know, hundreds of thousands, even if it, if, if it grows big enough. And then you, you start to have clients reach out to you instead of you having to market to them. Um, You know, even though they may be across the world or across the country or something like that, right? A lot of the things that I do consulting wise and service wise, you know, can be done via Zoom or, you know, I don't have to have them in person. So, you know, that that's a a huge help to me to be able to help a therapist or, you know, a a professor or clinician, you know, out in California when I'm in Texas, you know, or New York while I'm in Texas, we can hop on a Zoom call and hash out whatever consulting issues they need done, you know? So I, I think that's huge being able to, to reach instead of the eight people per day. Now, maybe it's 108 people per day, you know. And the thing that I love about it is being able to leverage the fact that we understand the challenges we're facing. Right. Medicare is cutting reimbursement, physical therapy services delivered by a PTA, 15 percent cut, like all of this stuff. It's not turning around. So my my responsibility is. How do I provide the best patient care experience? How do I leverage the best service without putting the financial burden solely on the individual receiving the service? So I share all the time, you know, my analytics and my stats, and I've got my best performing video, I think just crossed like $1,300 for an eight minute video. Um, When I record content, especially if I'm working with a patient, I'm sharing real experiences, I'm sharing real stories, But now YouTube is going to monetize that. I couldn't monetize that independently. So I might make $100 if I treat a patient for an hour, one-on-one through Medicare reimbursement. But if I can pull out a chunk of that and share it on a platform like YouTube, and then they share it out to the people who actually need to see that information, and I've got a monetizable asset that's going to be shared for a decade because knees aren't going to change, knee replacement procedures aren't going to change, the fear of pain and all that stuff isn't going to change. Now that one hour of my life that I would have traded for a hundred bucks before leverages out to a thousand or 1500 or or really it's, it's infinitely scalable. And now I can allow the patient care experience to be delivered without it being dependent on finance. You know, I always say like, I never want to be in a situation where I'm deciding I need three more units to pay my mortgage, or I need to see this person because I need to make a car payment. I want to protect kind of the sanctity of that patient care experience. And the way I do that is finding alternative ways to monetize it. People who want to buy the attention of my audience, I'll let them pay for the patient care experience. 
you know, and, and that's where you get into really understanding the power. And of course, YouTube versus Instagram and Facebook and all of the other platforms. I mean, YouTube is actively trying to put the best video in front of the person who needs to see it. Whereas the other social media platforms, three minutes after you post something, it's gone. It's done. Like nobody is going back through five years of your Facebook feed to find information. I have 2019 videos that are still gaining several thousand views a month, you know? So I've found that for me, the best return on my time investment is YouTube by far. Yeah. And I mean, you know, YouTube is essentially the next best search engine, right? Google owns it. Google's probably right. number one when it comes to search, but number two is, is YouTube. People are looking yeah. on YouTube. I mean, I do it myself uh, daily. I look up things on YouTube, how to do this, how to do that. Right. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to get down into the weeds of, of how to create a YouTube video that's going to, you know, be a banger and, and hit. But I, I think realistically, you know, just having that start and getting started um, and putting out consistent content uh, is, is really one of the best ways to, to gain that reach. I mean, you know, again, it's not necessarily something that's going to make you rich, although it, it can if it's done correctly, for sure. There's people whose full time jobs are, are just YouTube, right? Mr. Beast is making th uh, millions, you know, per year on YouTube. But I, I think the, the thing is, like, you know, you said, if you can replace, you know, maybe a thousand dollars or, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars a month, uh, you know, now you're looking at almost the price of bringing in a whole new therapist. You know, so right. so you're generating a whole therapist's income based on 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 YouTube stuff. I mean, again, my first paycheck from from YouTube was, I think, like I said, nine dollars and thirty six cents. So, uh, you know, it, it wasn't big money, but uh, little by little it's increasing, it's growing, you know, and that's that's the point behind this is just to stick with it and see see what it can get to, because, you know, I, I'm not trying to get rich off YouTube. But at the same time, it's a nice little side income stream that's coming in while I'm helping people out there while I'm helping the audience, while I'm trying to, you know, educate people on the things that they can do to make other streams of revenue. Because, you know, like you said, it, reimbursement isn't going to switch. It's not going to start going up miraculously, you know? So, uh, you know, we, we might as well get paid what we're worth. And this is one of the ways that we can really do that. And when we're looking, when we're looking at the platform and we're looking at, you know, it is absolutely a piece of digital real estate. And so where I've got a history in real estate, I own several commercial properties and made plenty of money in residential real estate. This is, you know, everybody's talking now a little bit about the metaverse, but really, I mean, we've got digital landscape, digital real estate right now. So my little YouTube channel, if I look at the total knee replacement channel, it's generating $1,000 a month. If I wanted to sell that channel, I could put a 30 times multiple on that and sell it right now. That's a contributing factor to the physical therapy website. So that adds value to my website. I just monetize my actual website. That's generating about $250 a month in display ads. You combine that with a thousand from YouTube. You combine that with about another 200 a month from Amazon. All of a sudden we start to realize we're building valuable assets. And so I've sold a physical therapy clinic. When I sold the actual brick and mortar clinic, the equipment had no value, right? 20 year old exercise equipment is penny, it's pennies on the dollar, there's no value. Um, the referral relationships have a little bit of value, but once Tony is gone or whoever the therapist is gone, those relationships tend to disappear also. So what is somebody actually buying? In my case with the brick and mortar clinic, they were buying access to insurance contracts that they couldn't have gotten otherwise. And I sold to the team that had been running that clinic for me for over a decade. So it was a great transition. But if I was somebody out there who didn't have that infrastructure and I was looking to build a value that I could sell in the future, building digital assets, building a YouTube channel, building Udemy channel, building um, a website that's gaining traffic, like those are things that you could then sell for 50,000, 75,000, 100,000 even if the actual practice itself doesn't have that much tangible value. Yeah, I think, you know, again, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head here. It's 
you know, the addition of four or five little pieces of, of digital assets or, or other revenue streams, right, that can really add up to help supplement whatever you're doing, you know, as a base uh, line structure. So I think, you know, that, that that's huge for, for people to realize when, when they're getting into this kind of digital world. And, and like you said, who knows what's to come with real digital uh, real estate and the metaverse and whatnot, right? But uh, Tony, what's one thing you would say, or or maybe a tip or a trick that you would give to, you know, somebody who's just getting started uh, and trying to start their YouTube channel? What are some some uh, key tips or hacks or or tricks that you've learned along the way? Yeah, so my shoulder channel is the newest YouTube channel that I'm I'm working on this year, and I can tell you that you know. Without a doubt, the better you understand the purpose of the YouTube algorithm and what it's trying to achieve, the better chance you have to build your audience. And that's what YouTube is really all about. So first, it's developing a vertical, developing a battery or a bank of videos on a related topic. Um, because what's going to happen is you put out a video. It could be a great video. It could be a terrible video. You put out a video and YouTube is going to test that video in, in front of an audience and it's going to base that audience on related topics. So I specifically chose shoulder and post-surgical care for a couple of reasons. One, I knew that there are multi-million view videos related to rotator cuff issues. Two, I knew that I was an expert or at least self-proclaimed expert in rotator cuff recovery. Like I do a ton of post rehab for rotator cuff surgery. I knew that there was a niche there. I also knew that I had something different to bring. I, I was not going to do the same content that was already out there. I could bring different perspectives to rotator cuff rehab, just like I could with knee replacement. That wasn't the typical stuff somebody would get from a Medline or from WebMD or anything like that. So the topic was a proven topic. The niche was large enough. There's, I think it was like four or 500,000 rotator cuff repair surgeries done in the US every year. Um, it had proof of concept in seeing other videos that had reached over a million views on the, the exact topic. And they weren't great like post-production videos. It was exactly what you and I are doing right now. So then what I did was I said, okay, here's my topic. It's gonna be shoulder. It's gonna be more specifically rotator cuff repair. Then I set out to produce 30 videos, all related to rotator cuff repair, very specific on that topic, because what happens is you produce the first, second, third, fourth, fifth video, YouTube will start testing an audience for that, but then you want other related videos from your channel showing up either in the sidebar or down below on mobile, so that when somebody sees video number one for you, they see video number two, three, and four. And so a person can start to kind of go through and binge watch a little bit. That is a huge signal to YouTube that, okay, this person's putting out something. So then they test a bigger audience and then we see how that does. And then a bigger audience. Um, I'll tell you the biggest mistakes that I see new content producers, new channels make, and you probably see me say it, please don't ask people to subscribe to your channel because what happens is, and you, you, Think about it logically. If you, F. Scott, have no interest, you're a therapist, I'm a therapist, you don't care to see the stuff that I put out. If you subscribe to my channel, the YouTube algorithm says, oh, he subscribed. But wait a minute, he didn't watch any of the videos or he clicked and watched 30 seconds of it. That's a confirmation signal to the algorithm that this is bad content. People are subscribing, they're willing to subscribe, but they're not going to watch. So either this content producer is using bad tactics, they're using clickbait, they're doing something wrong. Regardless, that is a signal to say, this is a crummy channel, these are crummy videos, even if you put hours and hours into the, the editing of the video. So when I launch a new channel, I never try to tell anybody to come subscribe. I never tell therapists to come look at my channel unless I think it's content for them. Um, Definitely don't do stuff like buy views, buy subscribers. I did that like decades ago. It's a big red flag, definitely stuff you don't wanna do. You wanna let the algorithm do the work. And then I've also shared lots of screenshots where I'll post the 30 videos, the 40 videos, and it'll sit dead. And then I'll go do something else. I'll focus on a different component of my business. I'll build a different website and then I'll come back. 
And what I see consistently is I've never had a video just from day one take off. I'll get a bump and then a flat line, but then a hundred days, 200 days, even a year after posting a video, all of a sudden you'll see it start to accelerate. And I've got multiple hundred thousand view videos where it sat dead under a thousand views for a year. And then something clicked and it started to accelerate and you have no idea which one it's going to be cringe videos, stuff that I'm like, oh, I don't want this to do well, all of a sudden does well. There's no rhyme or reason that I can identify, but it's something that's giving the algorithm the signals, you know? So I would say, don't do the stuff that you think makes sense. Like let the, the system work, produce content that real people are searching for. And that goes into keyword research and stuff like that, but answer real questions. Stuff at the top of the funnel, stuff like, do I use heater rights? Can I use a TENS unit on this? You know, can I play golf with a torn rotator cuff? Like those are questions that people are actually searching for. And then as you answer those real questions, look at people also ask on YouTube, on Google to find topics for YouTube. Look at ask the public to find topics for YouTube. And as you're building that, that bank of videos, understand, okay, maybe I'm not getting paid. Maybe I'm not getting views. I'm not getting traffic, but there's still value there. And that's where we look at, maybe I create some pages on my website that have like lists of video topics that I get organic traffic to my website from Google. You know, maybe I create a digital course on Udemy or I do an email course and I can use those videos that I created. So I'm multi-purposing those videos not just for youtube but for other stuff yeah those are great tips tony and all all along the way are you know ones that i've seen pop up time and time again so uh, i think you, you again have done a really good job of summarizing things to do and things not to do there for the, those just getting started so again thank you for your time thanks for coming on to talk about this stuff i i love this stuff and i love seeing what you're doing so uh, you know, overall, I've got a list of about 100 different side gigs and side hustles that that healthcare providers can do. And you, you've knocked off a bunch of them. So uh, yeah. it would not surprise me if I circle back around and talk to you again for another interview uh, in the not too distant future about another one of these uh, side gigs or side hustles. So, uh, you know, my, my big goal is to try to help people manage their their student loans, you know, and, and find ways, new and inventive ways to make some money to help knock down those student loans a little But uh, you know. To me, the YouTube channel stuff is just, uh, you know, find your niche, find your expertise and just go all in on it. What do you what do you like doing? What's your interests? You know, dive in on that uh, and just start creating, you know. Yeah, it, uh, it'll take off eventually if you're consistent enough, you know, and if not, that's a signal that you got to change things up and go a different direction. So uh, thank you again for your time and for coming on. Where can people find you if they want to follow up with you or if they have any other questions about uh, YouTube monetization and, and strategy? Yeah, so I try to share a lot of content on Learn Medicare Billing on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under Anthony Maritato, but I go by Tony. And just anywhere there is a group of, you know, physical therapy on Facebook, I'm probably going to be there. So I'm always available. I'm always happy to answer questions. I, I enjoy the, the connection. Awesome, Tony. As do I. It's been a pleasure, man. I can't, I can't thank you enough for your time, but uh, look forward to talking to you again in the future. All right. Have a good one, F. Scott.